Fusion, the international science radio show. We have a bouncer and the doors of perception. The good, the bad, the ugly. It gets pretty exciting. The myths, the truths. Toxicology. Astro seismology. Magnetism. The dark side. Genetically engineered potatoes. Planetoid. Planetoid. I love that word. <laughs> <laughs> Hello and welcome to Diffusion. Sit back and relax while we inject weird and wonderful science directly into your veins. I'm Ian Wolfe. On this edition, part two of Stephen Freeland's interview about space law. But first up, here's a look back at the science news of 2016. Twenty sixteen started out with the announcement of an Earth like world orbiting in the habitable zone of its star Wolf 1061 in the constellation Ophiuchus, fourteen light years away from Earth. Giovanni Caputo from the University of Urbino in Italy found that if people stare into another person's eyes for ten minutes, they start hallucinating. The Australian government redefined autism to stop children qualifying for therapeutic help because the program was too successful. Gravitational waves of stretched and shrinking space-time from spiralling black holes were seen by the Laser Interferometry Gravitational Observatory. The South Australian state government with the federal government reported that nuclear power is too expensive to make a profit, people don't want it, so... They intend to make billions of dollars by collecting the world's most dangerous radioactive waste and dumping it on Aboriginal land. The state government of New South Wales sacked 80 of its 270 water safety experts and 5 of its 6 most senior scientists after they published a report that the proposed Russell Vale coal mine would drain and waste 7 million tonnes of city drinking water every day from Lake Cataract. Researchers from the Pelling Laboratory for Biophysical Manipulation at the University of Ottawa have found that apples can be carved into shape for scaffolding to build organs with stem cells. They sell the kits online. The Human Augmentation Lab of Meiyo University in Tokyo invented the electric fork, chopsticks and cups that increase or decrease the salty flavour of your food when there isn't any salt added or when you've added too much salt for your taste with just a small electric current. At the Albany Medical Center in New York, signals from electrodes in the brains of people with epilepsy were collected and sent to at the Cognitive Systems Lab of Karlsruhe Institute of Technology in Germany, where they were converted into speech. The speech was then converted into text and sent. Researchers at the Max Planck Institute for Chemistry in Germany sampled the air from a cinema and were able to tell which movie people were watching and which scenes by the pattern of compounds they exhaled. A new solar cell configuration developed by Martin Green and Mark Kiever at the Australian Centre for Advanced Photovoltaics at the University of New South Wales has pushed sunlight to electricity conversion efficiency to 34.5%, a world record for unfocused sunlight suitable for rooftops. Unfortunately, the work relies on funding from the Australian Renewable Energy Agency, which the federal government announced that it would like to abolish. In June, the Australian public voted the Liberal National Party back for a second term of government by the slimmest majority. The Labor Party won the popular vote. One species of human gut bacteria was found to be the difference between social mice and loner mice which points the way to a treatment for people with autistic spectrum disorder. Researchers at the Department of Molecular Biology and Genetics at Cornell University in Ithaca, New York, identified markers in the blood and stools of people with chronic fatigue syndrome that have allowed them to correctly identify people previously diagnosed with the disease with an 83% accuracy. This may become the first clinical test for chronic fatigue syndrome. Researchers in Sweden have found that statistical software used in most functional magnetic resonance imaging, if MRI, 
brain scans over the last 15 years of research has major bugs that will invalidate thousands of experiments and observations about how the brain works. A team of researchers at the Wyss Institute for Biologically Inspired Engineering at Harvard University have grown a thumbnail-sized robot stingray, powered by heart muscles, grown from rat stem cells onto a silicone body, around a gold skeleton, genetically engineered to be controlled by light. Enzymes extracted from the digestive fluids of a carnivorous tropical pitcher plant allow people with celiac disease to digest the gluten in foods that would otherwise make them sick. Researchers found the mechanism that a type of bacteria uses to convert ammonia from urine into the rocket fuel, hydrazine. Jenny Connor at Otago University in New Zealand showed a direct relationship to how much alcohol you drink and your risk of cancer of the breast, colon, liver, oropharynx, larynx, esophagus, colon, and rectum. Excel broke science. Data in a fifth of genetic science papers were found to be wrong, because Microsoft Excel and its compatible programs changed genes with names that look like dates or numbers into actual dates and numbers, destroying the genetic data. Professor Jake Copeland and composer Jason Long from the University of Canterbury and Christchurch, New Zealand, restored a 1951 acetate disc recording of music generated by the vacuum tube computer used by Alan Turing himself, the Colossus Mark II. Researchers at the Yawahal Nehru Tropical Botanic Garden and Research Institute in Kerala, India, have discovered that three different kinds of carnivorous plants fluoresce blue when ultraviolet light is shone onto them, as happens in daylight. The extra blue attracts more insects for the plants to eat. Metabolic byproducts in humans with chronic fatigue syndrome are the same as those produced in roundworms when the worms go into hibernation. The 2016 Nobel Prize for Medicine or Physiology went to Yoshinori Osumi in Japan for locating the genes that regulate the cellular self-eating process known as autophagy and explaining how they work. Living cells extract protein and other nutrients from dead cells before flushing the waste away to be excreted. Disruptions to this mechanism contribute to illnesses such as Parkinson's disease, type 2 diabetes, aged dementia and cancer. Researchers from the Queen Mary University of London showed that a very few bumblebees can innovate and solve the puzzle of pulling strings to get food. Most bumblebees can be trained to pull strings to get food, more than half the bees that watch them can learn from the trained bees. Trained bees then pass this information on to the rest of the hive, who then show the next generation. At the Clem Jones Centre for Aging Dementia Research at the Queensland Brain Institute, Professor Jürgen Goetz found that ultrasound scanning protected the brains of healthy mice from changes in structure that cause cognitive problems in ageing brains. Researchers from the University of Sydney have found that milk from Tasmanian devils contains peptides that can kill microbes that are harmful to humans, such as antibiotic-resistant golden staph. Researchers in America and Europe found that most people want other people's driverless cars programmed to sacrifice the passengers to protect pedestrians. But they would only buy cars that were programmed to protect their life as a passenger, and sacrifice pedestrians. Researchers from Carnegie Mellon University in Pittsburgh can print glasses frames with visual textures that fool computer facial recognition systems, while looking like ordinary fashion eyewear to humans. Wearing the frames can help you to be wrongly identified as anyone in the system or to be invisible to the system. Newly appointed Science Minister Greg Hunt wrote a statement of expectations to order the Commonwealth Scientific and Industrial Research Organisation to reinstate public good research as a priority, and for the CSIRO to return to research into climate science by hiring 15 new people to replace the 1,500 staff fired. Middle-aged mice injected with extracts from teenaged human blood have younger acting muscles, livers and brains. 
The Ambrosia Company in California will charge people $8,000 to be treated with blood from young people. The Calico Company in California plans to filter blood from older people to restore protein levels back to how they look in the blood of young people. In South Korea, researchers are performing a study that looks at the effects of stem cell-rich umbilical cord blood and plasma infused into people 55 and over. All these companies hope their treatments will rejuvenate their patients. Last week, Sydney company Cube Rider's first payload was launched successfully to the International Space Station from Japan's Tanagashima Space Center. The one kilogram package contained 12 sensors and a computer which will run experiments from a thousand school children from 60 high schools, which are aligned with the Year 10 and 11 National Science, Technology, Engineering and Maths curriculum. And that was the Diffusion News for 2016. You're listening to Ian Wolfe on Diffusion Science Radio. Send emails to science at diffusionradio.com. We're brought to you across Australia on the Community Radio Network and podcast over the internet on www.diffusionradio.com. And now part two of the interview about space law. Stephen Freeland is a professor of international law at Western Sydney University. I continued the conversation by asking him what should be changed in Australian space law. Thank you for asking that as well, because it's a very timely question. You'll recall I talked about that many countries have national laws to regulate, in Australia's case, Australians who do things here or overseas into space or foreigners who do things from Australia. And that law, which is called the Space Activities Act, was put together in 1998. And it was put together on an expectation that Australia would become a major launch provider, i.e. there'd be launch facilities built. The one that went the furthest in its planning was on Christmas Island to launch satellites into space. That has never happened for a whole bunch of reasons. In the meantime, 1998 is a millennium away, literally, but also symbolically in terms of space technology. So the premise upon which the Australian space law was was developed hasn't emerged, but in any event, it really, because of the international obligations Australia has in terms of being a good space citizen, in terms of national security, but also in terms of liability, the premises of that act still work with companies like Optus and NBN, who's, who are big-ish companies and they send satellites into space. But what has happened is, in Australia, but also in every other country, the technology is changing in different ways so that a broader range of space actors or potential space actors are entering the scene. So in Australia, you're finding increasingly because of, for example, the development of small satellite technology and and other forms of much cheaper satellite technology, that smaller companies are emerging, entrepreneurs are emerging, startups are emerging who are all interested in space. They're not supplanting the big companies. The big companies still will do what they do and they do it very well. But, you know, the broader the technology, the broader the range of activities in the broader number of ways. And, you know, there's some disruptive technology. It's a really interesting market. But these smaller entrepreneurs in Australia are saying, hey, this law was put together with in a sense, big companies in mind with big balance sheets and et cetera, et cetera, lots of lawyers. And we're small companies and, you know, this, the argument goes, this law inhibits us. It doesn't make it easy for us. We believe it actually limits what we can do in Australia. And therefore, over the last, increasingly over the last five to 10 years, the industry in Australia is saying we need to upgrade our space law to meet the moves in technology. And the government has ultimately listened to that. And I had the privilege of being commissioned by the government, by the Department of Industry, to assist it in reviewing the Space Activities Act, which we've done. We had consultations within all areas of government, from defence to attorney generals, to finance, to foreign affairs, to industry, etc., etc. We also had 
a call for public submissions. We got many public submissions f- from interested parties who gave their views on the Act. I also independently sought information from a whole range of international actors because the questions that we were asking about the Australian legislation are similar questions to what every country is asking. How do you regulate in a very rapidly changing technological paradigm where you then have to balance between protecting the country in a whole bunch of ways, financially, national security, and making sure it complies with its obligations and is a good citizen on the one hand, that it therefore requires regulation. But on the other hand, balancing that with whatever is appropriate for your national circumstances, encouraging entrepreneurship, encouraging new activities that ultimately, hopefully, will give rise to economic benefits. And you've got to find the right balance. Every country will find balance in different ways. Australia has its own circumstances. And so as part of the review, we looked at those questions. I have submitted my report, which was 182 pages, to the Department of Industry, and to the, uh, which ultimately sent it to the Minister in the, at the end of August. And uh, I understand that has, is being reviewed as part of a broader discussion amongst government. So there are other questions in, as well. And I understand that things will be made public, including hopefully my review very soon, but I can't tell you when. But ultimately, and again, the decisions are governments. You know, I can only make my recommendations or pose options. Ultimately, government has to decide how and to what extent and in what ways it needs to change the regulatory framework to meet these different and sometimes opposing interests. And, you know, that's a difficult decision for for regulators, but they have to do it. They have to do it if Australia is to remain or become more competitive. And the global space industry is growing. Uh, Last year, it was calculated that the global space industry was approximately 350 billion US dollars. You know, that's a lot of money. And Australia would like to, of course, generate part, you know, a significant part of that, you know, and, and to do that you need to have an enabling law. Now, just by having enabling law, having that's not going to make it happen, but it certainly creates an environment where then innovation may be more likely to happen. But of course, as I said, everything is a balance. Everything is a policy decision. Everything will depend upon a whole range of factors and everything will be different according to which country you're dealing with. But Our review, I think, is of interest clearly to what happens here in Australia, but I know that lots of other countries are interested in what we're doing because, as I said, they're asking themselves the same questions. They'll come up with different answers, but they're asking themselves the same questions. And it's a real challenge for regulation in any area where technology moves very quickly because law is always way behind because law doesn't happen overnight. Lawmaking, even with the best will in the world, is a timely process, takes time. And so in the area of space, the technology is moving so rapidly that it's a real challenge for trying to work out what is appropriate. But I'm convinced that government takes space seriously. I would like them, of course, to make it take even more seriously, but you know that's because I'm, I'm a committed space junkie. But government does take it seriously. They understand the importance of space to the Australian economy, to our way of life, to our community. A day without space would be a disaster for Australia and every other country. So governments will need to consider and come up with policies that find this right balance in the interests of the country. And so we just have to wait and see what government comes up with. I've made my, my report to them Others, no doubt, have given them input. Uh, They're having discussions amongst themselves. So uh, we just have to wait and see, and hopefully we'll know sooner rather than later. I think programs like this are important because when you talk to people about space, there isn't a great comprehension about how intricate space is to our daily lives. In fact, one of the greatest challenges about space is to get people to take space seriously. You know, of course, we all are interested in space, but to take it seriously beyond the fact that it's perhaps about extraterrestrial life, as important as that is, but to take it seriously in the fact that it impacts on everything we do. And as I said, they've they've done studies about a day without space. It would be a disaster. 
it would be, you know, whole communities would collapse. The Australian economy would not function without space assets. The Australian military would be compromised. Uh, our disaster relief, our weather forecasting, our mapping, our, you know, so many things would be compromised without space. And so I think um, programs like this are important because I think hopefully people can get a feel, if they don't have it already, about how space is an important area. It's not, there are many important areas. And therefore the rules that we have in place, the law, the rules of the road, both at the international level and also at the national level, are themselves important. And everybody should have a, you know, should m make themselves aware of this and have an interest in it and give input so that we have the best possible rules that we can to serve the interests of the country and, in, in a sense, the broader international community. Stephen Freeland, thank you very much. You're welcome. Thank you for the time. That was Professor Stephen Freeland from Western Sydney University talking about space law. From 2008, our favourite hypnotherapist, Melinda Hall King, talking about deception in the playground. As a parent, you're frequently told that Johnny said something or Jane said something, whatever, and there's massive amounts of deception in the playground. Kids aren't always entirely truthful with each other or with their parents or with the teachers, for that matter. Are they good liars? Oh, some of them are extraordinary. Some of them are fantastic. As a scout leader, because I also do scouts, I'm a scout leader for the Joeys, which in Australia is the six-year-olds to eight-year-olds. So as a scout leader, we have lots of techniques to find out which kids are particularly good at bending the truth. <laughs> so these kids that are really good liars, do you think they're method actors that they sort of believe what they're saying when they do it? That they're acting just because they know what to do? Or are they sort of almost deceiving themselves while they do it so that they they believe it like a method actor. More often than not, they're a method actor. And mostly it's because they've had to believe what they want to achieve. So it's that, that whole believe it to achieve it scenario. Like with any actor at all, if you want to give a good performance, what you, want to, what you need to do is believe what you're doing. So if you wanted to make love to somebody, you had to believe that you really wanted to. And... It's all about pointing all your ideas in the right direction. You can get kids who'll fakely cry mm. based on what they remember and what they've seen of other children crying. So this is what they're crying, oh, and they'll make the noises and they'll, they'll do the whole thing, mm. but they're pretending. Yes. And then you get the kids who'll think of every bad thing that's ever happened to them. That's right. And therefore they cry and, and it's a genuine tear. Yes. Yes. But mm. they're still faking it because nothing real has happened in this instance. They've deliberately thought of everything bad that's ever happened to them. Yes, exactly right. And as I said, in Scouts we've got techniques to find out who... We have games, basically. We play games to see who's a good liar and who's not a good liar. And part of that is so that we get to understand how each child works in a little way. And we uh, assist them in bringing themselves more to the party so that they've got a lot to share and they can be more open and honest with us. Also so that we can tell when they're not. <laughs> There's... Evolutionary psychologists who believe that part of the way we developed our self-awareness and grew our brain as big as it is, is because we're such social creatures that we had to try and model other people and mind read what others were doing and thinking so that we could tell when they were deceiving us and when they weren't, mm. and in turn be able to model them well enough to deceive them. Yes. And so they couldn't catch us. When we were... <laughs> doing something, yeah, taking the last biscuit or something like that. No, I didn't take the last biscuit. <laughs> Sort of brain's arms race. Yes. Oh, yeah, exactly right. And it's the, the children who eventually become, oh, I don't know, actors or politicians or something like that, who can actually stand up and, and completely believe what they're believing in, what they're espousing. And it's those who will succeed in virtually any part of life because they can, as much as you can believe, if you can passionately believe in something, then you'll inevitably bring other people along with you. So what you need there is perhaps the the power to believe and the power to set that aside when it doesn't serve you and <laughs> choose another belief. <laughs> choose another belief, which some people do. Thank you, Melinda Hall King. And a big thank you to Andrew from Melbourne for his monthly donation. And that's all from us this week on Diffusion. Would you like to hear your voice on radio? Go to the website and click the tab on the right to send a voicemail to be played on air. We need more people contributing stories 
to Diffusion. Send your contributions, opinions, helpful suggestions, and donations to science at diffusionradio.com. That's science at diffusionradio.com. And please do send me an email so I know you're listening and you'd like to hear more episodes. Please like the Diffusion Science Radio page on Facebook and rate us on iTunes. Tell your friends. Follow me on Twitter at Ian Wolf. Check out the Patreon page at patreon.com slash Diffusion Radio. The news music was Rhinos Theme by Kevin McLeod of Incompetech.com. Check in production was Charles Willock. I produce Diffusion, which is broadcast around Australia on the Community Radio Network, including 8 Triple C in Alice Springs and Tennant Creek, 2 MVR in Nambucca Valley, and 3 MBR in the Mallee Border districts of Victoria and South Australia. Diffusion is syndicated globally on the National Science Foundation's Science360 internet radio station and also on astronomy.fm. Subscribe to the podcast on the Diffusion website, www.diffusionradio.com. That's www.diffusionradio.com and check the website for links, photos and videos about this week's show. If you enjoyed this show, then you can explore more than 900 previous episodes archived on diffusionradio.com, where the shows are labelled by keywords so you can focus in on the stories you want to hear. Subscribe to the Diffusion YouTube channel at youtube.com slash C slash Diffusion Radio. I'm Ian Wolf. Join us inside your audio device of choice for more science wondering next week on Diffusion Science Radio. <laughs>